Our next speaker is a really amazingly wonderful person. And um, I'm very glad that she uh, accepted the invitation to speak. Dr. Walensky and I didn't really give her much, very much choice. You're just going to do it. But um, Susan Garbett is a patient of Dr. Walensky's. And um, 10 years now, right? Monday. Yep. Um, Susan has written a book about Cordoma, which she will talk about, which is available if you guys saw it out on the, the table. That's a wonderful book. Susan is a, a peer guide to a number of people, and some of whom are here. Um, so she's a peer guide with our Peer Connect program, and um, she's also a member of our community advisory board and has given us very valuable feedback and information on our programs and services and materials. And um, so I'm really excited to hear her speak about her journey. This is the first time I've heard you speak in this way, so I'm excited to see it too. So please welcome Susan. I feel so honored to have been asked to speak to you this afternoon. We all have stories, whether you are newly diagnosed in the throes of treatment or a long-term survivor. Many of you have heard my story as it was featured as part of the Cordema Foundation Fall Appeal last year. I will try to give you the condensed version, but as most of you know, there are no shortcuts when it comes to Cordoma. My journey began at the Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville in 2009, where my husband Chuck and I went for a routine rheumatology evaluation. We never did talk about rheumatology. Rheumatologist Dr. Kenneth Calamia said, they found something on your MRI. It's a sacral chordoma. And I yell out, what's that? And he says, it's a very rare malignant tumor. I said, I know what Malignant mean and tumor, but how rare is it? He answered, one in a million. That's when I felt Chuck squeeze my hand. The next day I had an appointment with Dr. Mary O'Connor, an orthopedic oncologist, where we learned my problem had been misdiagnosed in Sarasota. What three doctors thought was a perineural cyst turned out to be a baseball-sized tumor on my sacrum which in comparing my MRIs had doubled in size over the past year. I was told surgery would be the best option for me and I would need a team of surgeons for this complicated operation. Both an anterior and a posterior of team of surgeons, a team of surgeons, excuse me, both an anterior and a posterior approach was recommended meaning going into the front one day and then a couple days later going in from the back. Then came the real kicker. There's a good possibility that I would lose bowel and bladder function. I remember Dr. O'Connor's words like it was yesterday. Susan, this is a big deal. I tried to hold back the tears unsuccessfully. The biopsy confirmed the diagnosis. I knew I needed to better educate myself about this new term that had turned my life upside down in order to make informed decisions. As soon as we began researching, the Cordoma Foundation website came up. Even 10 years ago, it provided us with the most, with invaluable information and gave us a better understanding of what Cordoma is, who could be effective, the types, their location, and risk factors. Trying to digest it all was difficult and unsettling in time, realizing there's only 300 cases in the U.S. a year. The foundation strongly encouraged patients to seek multiple opinions. Their doctor directory of Cordoma specialists became our focus because it gave us the tools to help us find qualified care. We diligently spent time doing research as where to go for the best possible treatment. It was a lengthy process, but well worth our time. Chuck and I were fortunate. We were retired, no children at home living with us, no job to rearrange, and financially we had the means to travel to receive the best care. I'm from Baltimore, so naturally Johns Hopkins was first on my radar. That is where we met Dr. Jean-Paul Walensky. 
I expected to see someone wearing a beret, not cowboy boots. <laughs> we sat down and Dr. Walensky in a gentle voice said, I know more about you than you know about me. What would you like to know? I'll be happy to answer any of your questions and clarify anything that you may need. He immediately made us feel comfortable and I proceeded to ask the list of questions I had brought. Dr. Walensky asked them, answered them one by one, always giving me time to digest what he was saying. Chuck and I were familiar with his stellar credentials and his answer just supported this confidence he projected. He told us that they had found that their surgeries are usually more successful and with fewer complications by going in only from the back. That meant only one surgery instead of two. I was thrilled with this news. Dr. Walensky continued explaining some pretty concerning stuff, but his compassion, concern, and calming manner helped melt away some of my anxiety. I have been given a gift, something that I don't take for granted. After a nine hour operation, my tumor was skillfully resected intact preserving the nerves that control bowel and bladder, or my life would be totally different. I no longer have a tailbone, most of my sacrum, or the S4 and S5 nerves. Like many of you, my road to recovery was long and challenging, filled with emotions, a few potholes and detours, a lot of physical therapy and pain management, with many small victories along the way. I am so grateful to Dr. Walensky, my fabulous medical teams, my husband, children, family, and friends whose love and support was overwhelming. The final pathology report from the Hopkins Tumor Board showed a chordoma with positive margins of dedifferentiated de chordoma, a more aggressive tumor. Seven months later, we were in Boston for proton beam radiation treatments in Massachusetts General Hospital under the extraordinary care of radiation oncologist, Dr. Norbert Leach. I remember receiving a surprise phone call from him at nine o'clock on a Saturday night. Dr. Leach discussed his protocol expectations, answered my questions, and proceeded to tell me exactly how he wanted me to send my records, almost 61 years worth. After a 40 minute conversation, I had four pages of notes when he hung up. I spent one week compiling his request, precisely as he instructed. Incredible, and so was Dr. Leach. My husband and I feel so blessed to have been able to stay at the American Cancer Society AstraZeneca Hope Lodge in Jamaica Plain, a suburb of Boston. During our two month stay, we met fascinating people from across the US and a few from other countries. Guests and caregivers rapidly became family. When people with similar situations are thrown together in a place they never thought they would be, the veil of privacy separating us just naturally seems to come down. There was a story behind every guest door. Everyone got to know each other quickly as we talked about ourselves, our families, jobs, past lives, and other dreams. The oddest thing was, except for those who continually wore hats and scarves, most of us looked like just like anyone else you might pass on the street. Passersby never saw the havoc cancer had caused in many of our bodies or the internal mental, mental struggles several of us were wrestling with. Leaving the lodge after 35 treatments was bittersweet. Yes, we were elated to be going home, but saddened to leave the friends we had made during those past months. We are still so grateful to the American Cancer Society and to the many organizations, students, and volunteers who made donations of food, staples, dinners, and entertainment, making our stay more pleasurable. I can honestly stay that our two month stay at Hope Lodge was one of the most amazing and rewarding experience we have had together. At one of my follow-up appointments with Dr. Walensky, we had the pleasure of meeting 
Dr. Alfredo Quiones Hinojosa. Got through that. Or Dr. Q for short. A neurosurgeon who performed over 200 brain surgeries while at Hopkins a year, and now is at the Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville. At Hopkins, Dr. Q led a team of 70, 20, excuse me, 25 scientists who were trying to understand and unlock the mystery behind the development of Cordoma. He enthusiastically told us his team had successfully developed a Cordoma cell line from my resected tumor after five years of trying. And the most exciting news is this cell line will continue to grow indefinitely. I left Hopkins that day feeling so energy energized, my feet were barely touching the floor. I couldn't believe that just by signing my name on a release form that allowed my tumor tissue to be used for research, other people with Cordoma might actually benefit. It's amazing what these scientists are doing to find a cure, and I feel so grateful to be a small part of it. Our guide, Sagar, Sagar Shah, now Dr. Shah, took, gave us a tour of Dr. Q's lab. I was able to see myself under a microscope, hold a mouse that was injected with my cells, and learn about their amazing research. We met many of their remarkable team. At, it was then I realized that I was old enough to be their grandmother. <laughs> Sobering. Today, my cells are being used by researchers in labs and institutions in the United States and around the world. And it gets better. Recently, the findings in a paper published in the journal Nature Medicine offer the strongest evidence yet that Bracuri is the driver of Cordoma, which opens the door to new treatments for this rare tumor. Josh sent me the article as soon as it was released. I admit much of the study was way over my head, but I did see that my cell line was used as part of this huge study. An email from Dr. Charles Lynn at Baylor University and a major contributor to this study said the following. In your cell line, the DNA in and around the Bracuri gene has been copied many times. The size of these copies was one of the first clues that we found suggesting that parts of the DNA that turned Bracuri on were very important in Cordoma. I think it's very fair to say that without your cell line, we would not have come to the same conclusions that we did in the study. It doesn't get any better than that. Most donors rarely get to meet the scientists who are using their tissue in their research. I have been fortunate to have met several, including Dr. Adrian Flanagan from the University College London Cancer Institute, who stopped me in the hall in the way at the 2016 International Conference in Boston and told me she was using my cell in her research. I asked Dr. Flanagan how to get my cells to you in London. She says, we freeze them, we fly them over, we give them a little glucose, we lose some but they send us thousand. I find all of this absolutely mind boggling. I have been so impressed with the Cordoma Foundation and how it has evolved and what it has accomplished in the 12 years of its existence. They have an incredible staff, although few in number, they are a powerful team dedicated to improving the lives of those affected by Cordoma while always working diligently to help find a cure. I would like the CF staff to stand so we can all applaud them for the wonderful work they are doing for all of us. Come on guys, we know who you are. I wanted to find a way to give back. Making an ongoing monthly contribution as part of the, their Perseverant Pledge Agreement was one way. Another opportunity came in 2016 when I was asked to be on the Community Advisory Board, which 
advises the foundation staff and the board of directors on a range of matters, ensuring that everything they do supports patients and their families in the best possible way. I have been a monthly support group facilitator for the Alzheimer's Association for the last 11 years. When the opportunity arose to be trained by the Cordoma Foundation to be a peer guide for those people wanting to talk to a survivor who has been through it and knows what it's like, I was all in. Being a peer guide since 2016 has opened a whole new avenue for connection with other sacral patients and is one of the most gratifying things I do. I don't give medical advice. My role is to be an active listener, to give support, and to help guide people through their journey by familiarizing them with some of the resources that are available. I have met such intriguing people from across the country and one from Australia through phone calls, emails, or texts. I have met some of the people I've been talking to over the years today at this conference. It is absolutely wonderful to connect with them in person. Some connections last until their treatments are over and others last much longer. My peer partner in California and I have been connecting for over three years. He once told me he considers me a part of his medical team. I was overjoyed by his comment. You can't imagine how emotional you get from emails like this one. I'm so grateful to you for the warmth and experience that you shared with us during an overwhelming time. I love you very much for being willing to pay it forward and give that to me and my family. Chuck asked me if I ever get depressed after all those phone calls, and my response is never. I feel more grateful for the gift I was given each time I hang up. Now a final antidote. While undergoing radiation treatment, Chuck and I often stop by the eighth floor of the Yorkie Cancer Center at MGH while waiting for the shuttle to go back to Hope Lodge. It was a place to unwind, get information, use their computers, take a class, relax through artwork, or enjoy their healing garden. They had an entire wall of books and DVDs of every kind of cancer you can imagine, and not even a printout on Cordoma. And there are Cordoma's Cordoma Center. It was then when I decided that if I ever got through all of this, I would try to attempt to write a book, since there wasn't much out there about Cordoma. In 2014, Confronting Cordoma Cancer, An Uncommon Journey, was published. On the back cover, I wrote, when you hear very rare cancer and you find yourself in a place you never thought you would be, when the fear sets in, when unwelcome challenges are directly in your path, when obstacles and burdens become harsh, we still have the ability to regain control and to fight to help ourselves all, through all that lies ahead by focusing on the power of the human spirit and hope. A reader wrote, we've all read your book since mom's diagnosis and, it and found it to be warm and informative. You did a great job of humanizing everything and the book really shined a light into the darkness for me personally. I want to leave you with a poem by Maya Angelou which resonates with me even before I was diagnosed. You may encounter many defeats, but you must not be defeated. In fact, it might be necessary to encounter defeats so you can know who you are, what you can rise from, how you can still come out of it. Thank you. Susan, thank you so much for that. That was really, really wonderful. And I think your peer guide partner was, was so right. You have paid it forward in so many ways. Um, and I think 
you know, truly embody what it, what it means to pay it forward. Um, and I think your story is case in point uh, to a belief that we have at the foundation, which is that, there, first of all, there, there are so many different ways in which each of us can pay it forward. And our belief is that really um, everyone in the community has something to offer, whether it be contributing tumor, whether it be serving as a peer guide. Um, and Susan, you have done so many of those things. So thank you. Um, you know, this community is, is really stronger because of you.